The most agonizing moment came as I watched her prepare for her date. Each stroke of makeup, every twist of her hair, seemed a betrayal as she adorned herself in an unfamiliar dress, paired with high heels I'd never seen her wear before. This transformation wasn't for me, her husband, but for Carl Phillips, her boss. It stirred a potent mix of betrayal, jealousy, and anger within me. While I toiled tirelessly to provide for our family, she was making herself alluring to another man outside of our marriage. It was all so bewildering. Our marriage had been nothing short of wonderful. Amanda had always been attentive and loving, never giving me cause to doubt her fidelity. Twenty years together had built a foundation of trust, and I never imagined she would stray. Yet, a month ago at her company dinner, Carl Phillips, the managing partner at her law firm, had paid her undue attention. It was the smirk he shot me after a dance with my wife that set off alarm bells. When I confronted Amanda, her defense of him only fueled my suspicions. Suddenly, the late meetings and missed lunches took on a new significance, prompting me to investigate further. The more I dwelled on the situation, the more my anger intensified. Amanda worked as Carl's personal assistant, serving under him at a prestigious law firm where he held the role of managing partner. Carl embodied the archetype of success, flaunting his wealth through luxurious cars, extravagant jewelry, and a young trophy wife named Wendy, whom he pursued after divorcing his wife of two decades. His penchant for jesting at others' expense was apparent. I vividly recalled an instance during a social gathering where he belittled my occupation. While my job entailed selling screws and fasteners to major retail chains, far from glamorous, it provided a comfortable living, earning me upwards of $200,000 annually. This income facilitated a fulfilling life for my family, affording our daughter Janet's college tuition and sustaining our pleasant lifestyle in a tight-knit community surrounded by good friends. Although I didn't boast Carl's status or rake in seven figures, our happiness seemed secure, at least that's what I believed. Yet the night he derided my profession in front of my wife and others, my frustration surged. It wasn't merely his arrogance that irked me, but the way Amanda defended him, even after witnessing my humiliation. Hey John, how's the nut and bolt business? I bet you get screwed a lot, aha. Uh -huh. It must be fun having to work at Home Depot every day, Carl quipped, accompanied by laughter from Amanda. My blood boiled at the mockery, and without a word, I turned and walked away. Amanda, to her credit, approached me, inquiring about my abrupt departure. When I shared my grievance, she attempted to downplay the situation. Oh, baby, he's just teasing. Carl likes to joke around. Don't take it so personally. Come back with me, he's actually a nice guy, she urged, coaxing me to return to the dinner. Against my instincts, I remained for the remainder of the evening, suppressing my unease. Reflecting on that moment now, I realize I may have overlooked warning signs. Despite my confidence and refusal to be anyone's fool, I failed to heed my gut feeling. I understood the allure Carl held for others, the epitome of an alpha male, strong, handsome, and affluent, the partner everyone gravitated towards. Amanda, as his trusted confidant and right-hand person, only added to his allure. It mattered little that he had a younger, attractive wife. To a man like Carl, acquiring everything, including another man's wife, was simply another conquest. Over the ensuing week, I took swift action to confirm whether my suspicions were warranted. With the arrival of six audio recording devices and five video cameras, I initiated my plan. I discreetly installed the first camera within the bedroom's smoke detector, positioning the others strategically throughout the house, each equipped with advanced features, including live feed capability, 8K recording, and wireless connectivity to a dedicated computer stashed in the attic, all remotely accessible via a smartphone app. In addition to the video surveillance, the audio devices added another layer of surveillance. One was cleverly concealed within a pen discreetly placed next to the kitchen phone, while another found its inconspicuous spot within her car. The remaining standard recording devices were nestled within her three favorite purses and discreetly positioned behind our bed. With this comprehensive setup, I anticipated capturing at least 90% of her conversations and any activities within her home. Despite my unease about the upcoming week, when I would be away on my sales calls, I proceeded with my plans. True to form, 
Amanda showered me with affection and intimacy, just as she always did before my overnight trips. Her gestures, laden with kisses and sweet words professing her love, reassured me of our bond. Her unwavering intimacy was a cherished aspect of our relationship, never failing to uplift me. On the eve of my departure, we shared a remarkable night together, deepening our connection. In the midst of such love and closeness, doubts about her fidelity momentarily wavered, almost prompting me to abandon my surveillance plan. However, I resisted the impulse and proceeded with my original intentions, embarking on my two-night trip as scheduled. With a farewell kiss, I set off on the road by 6 p.m., bracing myself for the three-hour drive to the hotel. During the drive to the hotel, I found myself mulling over the events of the past six months, searching for any subtle deviations. Apart from the unsettling encounters with her boss, those two scenes etched in my memory, marked by his smirk and attempts at belittling me, nothing else stood out. A wry smile crept onto my face as I realized the folly of my paranoia. Upon reaching the hotel, I swiftly checked into my room and settled onto the plush king-size bed. With my laptop in hand, I eased into a state of relaxation. After skimming through work emails, I accessed the server in my attic remotely, eager to review the footage from the past three hours. While I anticipated finding nothing of significance, I needed to validate the functionality of the remote access system. Hastening the video playback to three times its normal speed, I skimmed through until my wife's figure appeared in the bedroom. Dialing the speed back to normal, I indulged in watching my stunning, alluring wife engaged in a phone call. What caught me off guard, however, was the unexpected phone conversation she had an hour after my departure with Carl. As the video streamed her side of the conversation, I listened intently, unable to shake off the unease settling within me. Her side of the conversation with Carl. Hello, my love, he's left, and I find myself alone once more. Yes, for two nights this time. When can you join me? But won't your spouse wonder where you're off to? Oh, that's fantastic. Could you stay the night with me? I ache to wake up by your side. Absolutely, without a doubt. What time will you arrive then? All right, see you soon. I adore you, darling. I sat there, stunned. We had just shared an intense night together, and she professed her love for me repeatedly. Yet now, barely an hour later, she's inviting him over to stay the night. Who was this woman? How could she express such deep affection for me and then betray me moments later? Was he really coming over tonight? Part 2. Now let's go back to the beginning of the story. For the next hour, I observed through my equipment as my once loving wife readied herself to rendezvous with her lover. Witnessing her shower, Don Lingerie slip into heels, meticulously apply makeup, and fuss over her hair for a half hour was a tormenting spectacle. While I had always acknowledged her attractiveness, the painful truth lay in the fact that she never adorned herself in such a manner for me. Anger and envy surged within me as I comprehended that she was meticulously preparing for Carl, not her devoted husband. The reality of it all remained difficult to grasp. Was Carl truly on his way tonight, or was this all a misunderstanding? That lingering question was swiftly answered a few minutes later when the doorbell chimed, revealing Carl's arrival as captured by the video camera in real time. Witnessing Carl's brazen entrance into my home and his unabashed kiss with Amanda before the lens was enough to induce my first bout of nausea that evening. You look stunning in that dress, babe. I can hardly wait to have it off and spend the night with you, he remarked, his wide grin fixed on Amanda. Their exchange kindled fury within me, but that anger soon morphed into profound anguish as I observed Amanda take his hand and lead him upstairs to her bedroom. The agony intensified as I bore witness to actions she had never bestowed upon me, suffused with jealousy, rage, and indignation. After a second round of retching into the trash can, I endured the next hour by watching and listening to their interaction. Though I knew my marriage was irreparably shattered, and I should have detached myself, their conversation proved to be the most excruciating aspect of that harrowing night. As they lay intertwined, Ashol initiated the conversation. So, the little cuck is away for a few nights. Good, you'll be mine for the next two days. I'm thrilled you can stay the night, 
baby. I've been yearning to wake up next to you for so long. I adore being with you, Carl. Yes, I'll relish taking you over and over again all night all hubby sweats away. What fool. Be kind, Carl. I love him, and he's a good man. Then why are you letting me share your bed? Carl, you're the most amazing man I know, and I appreciate everything you do for me. But we're both married, and we should just cherish the time we have together. That makes sense. I adore everything about you too. You give me more love and affection than my wife or any other woman I've known. I just adore the way you make me feel, Amanda. It stung deeply because that love he spoke of was meant to be solely mine. Now I realized she was sharing her love with another man. I continued to listen and watch as they embraced, kissed, and conversed. Does your cuckold husband satisfy you as much as I do, Amanda? He's a wonderful lover, but no, he's not like you. You do things to me that I can't explain. I sat there, engulfed in sadness and hurt, a profound sense of loss weighing heavily upon me. With a heavy heart, I closed the computer, unable to bear any more of the betrayal unfolding within the confines of my own home and bed. Despite hours passing without sleep and wrestling with my seething anger, I knew that a tumultuous journey of pain and retribution lay ahead. Upon my return home, everything appeared normal. There was an air of total love and respect, as if nothing had transpired. Amanda greeted me warmly with a tight hug and an abundance of kisses. She behaved as though nothing had occurred during my absence. However, instead of the love I had always felt for her, I now recoiled at her touch, repulsed by her affection. Summoning every ounce of acting skill, I portrayed a facade of normalcy to the best of my ability. Gathering all recordings and videos, I meticulously secured copies on the cloud for backup and created an encrypted file on my PC. Over the ensuing two weeks, I ensured that every moment of Amanda's time was spent with me, leaving no opportunity for clandestine meetings or clandestine rendezvous. I kept her occupied, preventing any chance of a quick liaison or late-night encounter. Her inquiry about my next trip only heightened my suspicion, confirming their eagerness for my departure. One morning, as she drove to work, I clandestinely listened to their conversation, further confirming my suspicions. When's your wimpy husband going out of town again? Not sure, but I'll find out. It should be soon, baby. Armed with that knowledge, I devised a one-night trip to ensure he'd come over while I was away. The plan began to take shape. That very night, while we were engrossed in watching a movie on TV, my unfaithful wife casually inquired, Honey, when's your next trip? Suppressing my anger, I replied with a jesting tone, Sweetheart, are you trying to get rid of me? Do you have a secret lover who visits when I'm away? Unfazed and showing no hint of guilt, she responded, Don't be silly. I love having you at home. I was just hoping your traveling had slowed down. No, sorry, sweetheart. The job still demands travel. Yes, next Tuesday, I have an overnight trip scheduled, and I'll be back sometime on Wednesday. In a convincing tone, she lamented, I hate when you leave. I wish you didn't have to travel like that. I miss you so much when you're gone. Then she embraced me, kissed me passionately, showering me with affection that made my heart ache. The realization that she bestowed this same love upon another man stirred a primal rage within me, but I maintained my facade, continuing as if nothing was amiss, knowing that the following week would set my plan into motion. On Tuesday, I packed for my trip and Amanda, and I shared what would be our final lovemaking session. After tonight, there would be no us anymore. As I prepared to depart that evening, she bestowed upon me a tender kiss, and I couldn't help but wonder if she noticed the sorrow in my eyes as I gazed at her for the last time. Her expression shifted, leaving me uncertain of what was going through her mind. Part 3. Show Time Rather than embarking on an out-of-town journey, I drove back to my office and parked my car. Returning to my desk to work late was not out of the ordinary, and the few colleagues present didn't question my reappearance. Around 7.30, the video camera sprang to life as Carl entered my home, exchanging yet another affectionate kiss with my soon-to-be ex-wife. It was show time. Using my phone app, I deactivated the video camera and stowed my cell phone in my desk drawer, avoiding any potential tracking via GPS during my supposed trip. 
Stealthily exiting the office, I retrieved the folding electric bike from my car trunk. With its silent electric motor capable of speeds up to 30 miles per hour and a range of 50 miles, I donned a black hoodie and cautiously embarked on the 12-mile ride back to my house. The purpose of the bike was stealth. Its discreet nature allowed me to return home within 20 minutes, undetected. Parking the bike discreetly at the rear of the house, I entered through the right rear sliding door. Ensuring my presence went unnoticed, I listened intently to the noises emanating from the bedroom. Once satisfied they were engaged and oblivious to my return, I retrieved the short-barreled shotgun and aluminum bat I had strategically positioned in the closet, proceeding silently toward the bedroom. With careful precision, I positioned the shotgun against the wall just outside the bedroom, gripping the bat tightly as I silently turned the doorknob to the softly illuminated room. Amidst their clamorous lovemaking, they remained oblivious to my presence as I approached the bed with measured steps. He lay atop my wife in that moment, lost in their passion. Without hesitation, I delivered a forceful blow to the side of his head. The dull thud of metal meeting flesh was the only sound, momentarily overpowering the cacophony of their activities as the 250-pound figure crumpled to the floor. In the midst of his descent, I seized the shotgun and flicked on the lights, jolting Amanda into awareness. Staring at me with a mixture of astonishment and horror, she cried out, Oh God, no. Please, no. This can't be happening. Why are you here? You're supposed to be away. Well, you vile scum. Perhaps the better question is why are you sharing our bed with another man? Now, be silent and listen. The intruder, now semi-conscious, sat slumped against the wall, blood oozing from a six-inch gash inflicted by the unforgiving metal bat. I observed him as he gradually regained awareness, his gaze meeting mine, filled with rage and disbelief. Damn, that hurt. Why'd you do that, man? He groaned, rubbing his injured head. Are you kidding me? You sleep with my wife in our bed, and you think I won't react. I retorted, my voice laced with anger. What are you going to do? He asked, his nervousness palpable as he eyed the gun I held aimed at him. Are you worried, big guy? Afraid this scumbag is going to hurt you? I know you two have been having an affair behind my back, and tonight I'm going to get my revenge. I'm going to kill you, Carl. You're going to die today, I spat out, contempt dripping from every word. Everything you've worked for will be gone. I hope it was worth it, asshole. Dude, if you kill me, you'll go to jail for the rest of your life, he protested, desperation evident in his voice. Screw it. We're all going to die today. How about that, asshole? I taunted, relishing their fear. Though I had no intention of killing anyone, I enjoyed watching them squirm. I continued to play the part, escalating the tension. Amanda, curled up in a ball, was sobbing uncontrollably. Baby, please don't do anything stupid. I love you, I really do. Put the gun down and let's discuss this, she pleaded, her voice trembling with fear. Grinning maliciously, I turned the gun toward her and sneered, shut up, cheater. This is all happening because you couldn't keep it in your pants. Whatever happens tonight is on your conscience. Look at your wussy lover. He just pissed himself. Looks like you're just a little boy. Not really a man, are you asshole. You have to wear diapers, I ranted, letting them know I was unhinged and unpredictable. It was a ploy to keep them on edge, to make them realize they needed to calm me down if they wanted to survive. The custom shells loaded in the shotgun contained a mixture of 25% salt and 75% oleoresin capsicum, commonly used in pepper spray. My intention wasn't to end a life, but to inflict excruciating pain upon the despicable man. I had no desire to end up behind bars for murder. Instead, I aimed to instill a lasting fear and unforgettable memory in both of them. After Big Carl regained his composure from the blow to his head, he foolishly decided to lunge toward me in an attempt to disarm me, playing right into my hands. Seizing the opportunity, I took a calculated step back and fired the first round between his legs. The explosion reverberated loudly, but his screams overshadowed any other sound. A thick cloud of capsicum enveloped him, rendering him unable to see or breathe without gasping for air, while the searing pain engulfed him like never before. 
I was taken aback by the devastation the blast inflicted on his reproductive organ. Even a non-lethal projectile fired at such close range tore through flesh and peppered the surrounding skin, causing unimaginable agony. As he writhed in pain and bled profusely, I laid out the plan. Giving him a firm kick to grab his attention, I directed my words towards both him and my soon-to-be ex-wife. Listen up, you scumbag, and you too, my unfaithful wife. I'll be leaving shortly, and you too will take this sorry excuse of a man to the emergency room before he bleeds out. You won't call 911. Instead, you'll drive him to the hospital in your car. You will keep this incident between us, and you'll claim I had no knowledge of your affair. If either of you implicates me or mentions my awareness of your adultery, the videos, audio recordings, and photos I've amassed will be shared with Ashwell's wife and your partners at the firm. Additionally, a link to a website containing over two hours of incriminating footage will be distributed to everyone in your circles. You can fabricate whatever story you like for the police, but my name must not be mentioned, and you must maintain that I was entirely unaware of the situation. Asshole, you will not terminate my future ex-wife's employment. She will need the job after our divorce is finalized. If you attempt to retaliate against me, or if she resists the divorce settlement, I will unleash everything. At that point, consequences won't discriminate, and I'll expose everyone, including myself, if necessary. You both inflicted pain on me, and now it's my turn. Get him to the hospital before he bleeds out, and remember my conditions. I exited the same way I entered, ensuring the lock was secure before departing. I stowed the bat and gun in a duffel bag and slung it over my shoulder. Quietly and inconspicuously, I made my way out of the vicinity. As I rode the bike back to my office, I disposed of the bat and gun in separate locations in the river. Before my return, I discarded the surgical gloves I wore. Upon returning to my office, I discreetly stowed the bike in my car and resumed my place at my desk by 9 o'clock. I bid farewell to some of the eight staff who were still laboring late into the night. To all outward appearances, my vehicle never left the parking lot, and I remained at my desk throughout the evening. In the event of an accusation, it would be their word against mine, with no tangible evidence to support their claims. By the time I arrived home this afternoon, chaos had unfolded. Carl had undergone surgery to repair his injured reproductive organ. A team of surgeons had to painstakingly reconstruct what remained, a mere fraction of its former size. He bore 18 stitches on his shaven head, a consequence of the concussion sustained from the impact. According to his account, the last thing he recalled was approaching his personal assistant's residence with some paperwork before waking up in the hospital. He claimed no memory of encountering anyone or of being struck. Sensing the precariousness of his situation, he wisely chose to remain silent, understanding the leverage I held over him and his career. Amanda, consumed by distress, remained tight-lipped about the incident. Her only assertion was that she heard the gunshot and found Carl lying injured outside, prompting her to rush him to the hospital without waiting for an ambulance. Neither could elucidate why Carl was found unclothed, and despite their steadfast adherence to their respective stories, Carl's wife remained unconvinced, posing a significant threat to his future. I spent the afternoon dismantling the surveillance apparatus, transferring all data to an encrypted cloud server, and disposing of the equipment. Any vestiges of evidence linking me to their affair were now securely stored in the cloud, beyond anyone's reach. Around 6 p.m., Amanda entered the living room to find me seated, nursing a bottle of my finest whiskey. I remained silent as she took a seat across from me on the couch, her expression shattered and despondent. Witnessing her in such a state, I couldn't help but feel a fleeting pang of sympathy. With tears streaming down her cheeks, she began to speak, her voice trembling with emotion. John, I understand what you saw was devastating, but you need to believe me when I say I wasn't in love with him. I know how it looked, what I said, it must have hurt. Even in those moments with him, my thoughts were of you. I spoke to you within myself, every action was for you, baby. When you were absent, the loneliness was unbearable, and Carl provided temporary solace. Please, you have to believe me. Her explanation left me speechless, grappling with the incomprehensible justification she presented.
Apparently, she had been intimate with him while maintaining thoughts of me. Despite her words, doubts lingered, trust shattered irreparably. Amanda, I've listened to your plea, but I cannot erase what I witnessed from my mind. Even if those words of love were intended for me, I cannot shake the feeling that they belong to Carl. It's over, Amanda. Twenty years of what I thought was happiness, tarnished by your boss's betrayal and your infidelity. We'll both carry the weight of your actions for the remainder of our lives. Thank you for the pain and anguish you've bestowed upon me. It's a souvenir I'll cherish forever, I retorted bitterly. What happens now? She inquired, tears continuing to cascade down her cheeks. Well, you and I are finished. I'll never comprehend how you could betray me like this, or why. That's a burden I'll bear indefinitely. I won't expose your infidelity, as promised, but forgiveness is beyond reach. Janet and your parents will never know that they have a whore for a mother and a daughter. I'll let you explain why we're getting divorced, but I warn you, do not make me the bad guy. If you do, it won't end well, as I'll make sure everyone knows that you're nothing but a cheating adulteress. I'm putting the house up for sale, and you need to find a place to stay in the meantime. Since you're the one who screwed it up, you need to move out. I'm not asking. That's what you will do. Let me know where you want the divorce paper sent. Sign the papers and don't fight the divorce, or it will be painful for you and your boyfriend. Amidst her tears, she attempted to speak. He's not my boyfriend, and I don't love him. Can't we work this out? Is there anything we can do? I know it's too late after what I've done, but I can't live without you, and I'll do anything to keep us together. I never wanted to lose you. Please don't leave me. You know, Amanda, if it was just about you sleeping with him, maybe we could have sought counseling or worked through a breakup, but it ended when I witnessed you doing things to him that you would never do to me. It took my breath away when you told him you would never do that for me. Yes, I heard you say it. That alone extinguished any chance of reconciliation. But what truly shattered my love for you was the way you shared with him a love that was meant solely for me. The words you spoke to him destroyed us and everything I ever felt for you. And because of that, I can never take you back or trust in your love again. Your betrayal is unforgivable, and I want nothing more to do with you. Once the divorce is finalized, you'll be out of my life for good. And as for that scumbag, if he ever crosses me again, I'll make sure both of you regret it without hesitation. Despite hours of pleading for forgiveness, she left the following morning and sought refuge with her parents until the house sold. Over the ensuing week, the police interrogated me, attempting to elicit a confession. With the guidance of my lawyer, we made it clear that without evidence linking me to the incident, I would no longer cooperate without a warrant. With no evidence to support their claims and my solid alibi, they ceased their inquiries. The incident was eventually chalked up as a random burglary and assault. Amanda and her family incessantly begged for reconciliation. They professed her love for me and pleaded for forgiveness, proposing counseling and various other remedies. Yet, I ignored their calls and refused to entertain their pleas. I changed my phone number and severed all ties with them. Losing her tore me apart. Every moment without her was agonizing but the memory of her infidelity and how she lavished her love on another man was insurmountable. Now, Amanda, a 42-year-old single mother, resides in a modest one-bedroom apartment reliant solely on her income. The comfortable life she once knew has vanished. Her daughter and family have distanced themselves, holding her accountable for the demise of our marriage. Amanda found herself isolated, abandoned by Carl, who prioritized salvaging his own marriage. At work, Carl's treatment of her turned sour as he shifted blame onto her for his personal and marital woes. Unable to continue working alongside her, he demoted her to the administration area, offering no increase in pay. Her once esteemed position, working closely with one of the partners, was stripped away and rumors spread about her past relationship with Carl, leading to mistreatment from her colleagues. Now confined to a monotonous and uninspiring job, Devoid of any prospects for advancement, Amanda found herself in a downward spiral towards depression. With no friends to turn to, a failed marriage, and a family that held her accountable for the divorce, she plunged deeper into despair. Each night, she wept in solitude, longing for John with every fiber of her being. 
Her heartache was constant, her thoughts consumed by regret and loss. Despite Janet's attempts to support her mother, Amanda's downward trajectory continued, evident in her physical deterioration as she neglected her health, relying on alcohol to numb the pain. Refusing to care for herself, she insisted that without John, she had no reason to prioritize her well-being. When Janet sought advice from her father, he empathized with Amanda's plight, but could never overcome the betrayal, severing all ties with her. Meanwhile, Wendy pieced together the truth and exacted revenge on Carl, relegating him to one of the guest rooms and extracting a heavy toll for his infidelity. Embracing her newfound freedom, Wendy immersed herself in a series of relationships with younger men, keeping Carl around solely to foot the bills. Although they maintained a facade of togetherness for public appearances, they lived separate lives. Carl's actions had irreversibly altered the course of his life, leaving him incapable of finding love or solace with another woman. The weight of that pivotal moment, when his world shifted due to his lust for another man's wife, would haunt him for eternity. Despite his seething animosity towards me, several months passed without incident. However, fate had its own plans. Later that year, during a night out with my colleagues, I was ambushed and savagely assaulted outside a bar, enduring a brutal beating until my friends intervened. The assailants fled before the authorities arrived, leaving me hospitalized with broken ribs and 20 stitches. It was evident that they harbored a lethal intent, and had it not been for the timely intervention of my companions, their vicious assault might have claimed my life. I knew in my bones that this was retribution orchestrated by Carl, and I wasn't the least bit surprised. Six weeks elapsed, and as I recuperated, I resolved to confront Carl. Placing a call to his office, I requested to speak with Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips, please, I addressed his secretary. I'm sorry, he's currently in a meeting. May I take a message? She responded. Yes, please inform him to meet me at the French Deli across the street at 1 p.m. this Friday, I instructed. I'm afraid I don't schedule appointments for Mr. Phillips, she replied. Simply relay the message. Write this down, 1 p.m. Friday, French Deli, be there alone. John, just hand him that note and he'll understand its significance. Thank you, I concluded. Part 4, Friday Lunch Seated at a table with a clear view of the entrance, I watched as Carl entered the French Deli alone. His eyes locked onto mine as he approached the table. Sit down, I instructed, my tone firm. What do you want? He spat. Ignoring his hostility, I began, thank you for coming today. Your associates certainly did a thorough job on me, but unfortunately for you, they didn't quite finish it. By ignoring my warning about seeking revenge on me or my family, you've left me with no choice but to take action. I handed him a folded piece of paper and continued, here is a link to a website that's been specifically set up for you, Carl. Don't bother attempting to shut it down. It's operating out of Syria with three redundant servers spread across different locations. It's untraceable, and even if you were to locate the initial server, the chances of finding the other two are slim to none. You're in serious trouble, and I hold all the cards. That's the website address. Take a look when you return to your office. I've deliberately obscured Amanda's face, as she shouldn't have to suffer for your transgressions. She's endured enough already. Once you've perused the website, I want you to contemplate how your colleagues at the firm will perceive your actions, how your wife will react, and the impact it will have on your children, friends, and family when they stumble upon the two hours of incriminating footage. I intend to distribute these videos across several popular platforms, along with your name, profession, address, and phone number. Carl's anger simmered beneath the surface. You've already destroyed my life, and I'll never be the same, especially sexually. Cease this madness, or I assure you, you'll regret it. You see, Mr. Phillips, that's precisely why we're here today. I'm here to bring an end to this. You've stripped away the most valuable thing in my life, my wife. You've shattered our 20-year marriage, and I refuse to let you walk away unscathed. I'm willing to risk whatever consequences you throw my way because I fully intend to exact revenge for the beating your associates inflicted upon me. All right, calm down. What are your terms for making this situation disappear? Carl interjected. 
I have two non-negotiable demands, I stated firmly. Firstly, you must cease any acts of retaliation against me or anyone in my circle, including Amanda. Secondly, you must deposit $1 million into this account by the close of business on Friday. If the funds aren't transferred by Friday at 9 p.m., I will take decisive action. I know your net worth, and I also know what I could potentially gain through legal means, so consider this modest sum I'm requesting as a gesture of goodwill. And how can I be sure you won't ruin me regardless? Carl inquired worriedly. You won't. My word is my bond, and you'll just have to trust me on that. But let me be clear, if you fail to comply, there's a 100% certainty that this website will become infamous by Saturday morning. By the way, do you know how I discovered your affair with my wife? I paused, letting the question linger in the air. No, I was curious about that, Carl admitted. It was at your last company dinner. I caught that smug smirk on your face after that dance with my wife. Your arrogant grin set off alarm bells, prompting me to dig deeper into your affair and ultimately seal your fate. You were one of the most conceited individuals I've ever encountered, and I hope you endure the consequences for the rest of your days for what you've done to my once happy marriage. Epilogue The funds were transferred, and we proceeded to sell the house, dividing the assets between us. Amanda would have enough financial stability to lead a comfortable life, provided she continued working or found another partner. As part of our agreement, Carl ensured her employment, but their relationship remained strictly professional. Amanda never remarried, seldom ventured into the dating scene, and lived with the weight of the pain she had inflicted upon both of us. Losing her marriage and the love of the man she envisioned spending her life with left her isolated and despondent. She passed away before reaching her 50th birthday, a shattered and melancholic soul. Only her daughter Janet attended the somber occasion of scattering her ashes. Meanwhile, I carried on working for a few more years before retiring to a serene oceanfront town. I found companionship in a kind-hearted woman who stimulated me intellectually, yet I never managed to replace the unique love Amanda once bestowed upon me. We never communicated again, and my knowledge of her fate came solely from Janet, whom I cherished dearly. Although we conversed daily and maintained a strong bond, Janet seldom broached the topic of her mother, aware of the enduring pain I harbored. While Amanda's passing brought a sense of closure, it also served as a poignant reminder of the deep wounds I carried with me. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.